on World News Tonight. Promising news. Pfizer says the race to contain the Omicron variant may be led by a third booster jab. Surprise storm. Sydney battered under heavy downpours as flooding sweeps the nation under danger. Boycotting Beijing. Diplomats around the world join in on calling out China against the Winter Games. Tis the season. Australia lights up in an array of beautiful lights display, allowing citizens a time of wonder. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's updates on the COVID pandemic. BioNTech and Pfizer said a three-shot course of their COVID-19 vaccine was able to neutralize the new Omicron variant in a laboratory test and they could deliver an Omicron-based vaccine in March 2022 if needed. The world is still scrambling to understand the true threat posed by the Omicron coronavirus variant, first discovered last month in South Africa. Those scientists are alarmed by the speed at which it transmits, and it's been detected in more than 50 countries. It's unclear whether Omicron causes less serious symptoms or if it's mutated further than previous vaccines. But Pfizer-BioNTech Laboratories said Wednesday that a third booster of their jab could be effective against the variant. Laboratory studies demonstrate that three doses of our vaccine neutralize the Omicron variant, uh, whereas two doses show significantly reduced neutralization of this uh, new variant. However, the World Health Organization feels it's too soon to say whether this is accurate, as Pfizer's data is preliminary and yet to undergo a scientific review. It urged countries to keep their guard up, adding that the variant may more easily infect people who'd had the virus or been vaccinated, but that we still don't know enough. Emerging data from South Africa suggests increased risk of reinfection with Omicron, but more data are needed to draw firmer conclusions. There is also some evidence that Omicron causes milder disease than Delta, but again, it's still too early to be definitive. Omicron's discovery has triggered new restrictions worldwide as countries race to protect themselves and boost inoculation rates. Global vaccine producers are already tweaking their recipes in case an Omicron-specific dose is needed, with production expected to get underway early 2022. The world is on alert over the highly transmissible Omicron variant of COVID-19. There are hopes that it turns out to be less severe than Delta. And the World Health Organization appears to back this idea up, saying that while more research is needed, Omicron does seem to be more contagious, yet less severe. The WHO says the Omicron variant seems more transmissible, but less severe than other variants. Health Emergencies Program Director Michael Ryan said in an interview with AFP that preliminary data doesn't show Omicron to be a more severe disease than other variants like Delta. And he added that if anything, the strain is leading towards less severity. The organization's Director General Tedros Adenam Ghebreyesus also cited studies from South Africa that found people who contracted the Omicron variant faced much milder symptoms than those who were infected by the Delta variant. But the director general said much more research is still needed. And he urged governments to boost their surveillance and examine just how Omicron is behaving. The WHO also stressed the importance of getting vaccinated, even though data on whether current vaccines are effective against Omicron is only just starting to come out. Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson apologized and his advisor resigned after a video emerged of senior aides joking about a Christmas party at Downing Street last year when social events were banned under COVID-19 rules. Later, PM Johnson announced tighter COVID restrictions amid a surge in Omicron cases, including guidance to work from home and mandatory COVID passports. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Wednesday imposed tougher COVID-19 restrictions in England dubbed Plan B to slow the spread of the Omicron coronavirus variant. Johnson ordered people to work from home, wear masks in public places, and use vaccine passes for access to nightclubs and venues with large crowds. I want to be absolutely clear with you. I don't believe we can keep going indefinitely uh, with 
uh, uh, non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions, uh, I mean restrictions on people's way of life, uh, where just because uh, a substantial proportion of the population still sadly has not got uh, vaccinated. And I think we're going to need to have a, a national conversation about the, the way forward and, uh, and the other things that we can do uh, to protect those who are, are hard to reach, who haven't got vaccinated for one reason or another, who, who may have medical uh, reasons why they can't get vaccinated, other ways of, of protecting them. The news comes as Johnson faces a backlash after a video surfaced showing senior Downing Street staff laughing about holding a Christmas party during lockdown a year ago. The video leaked to the UK's ITV on Tuesday, showing Johnson staff, including his former press secretary Allegra Stratton, holding a mock press conference joking and laughing about a Downing Street Christmas party on Friday night when such festivities were banned. Stratton has now resigned from her current role as a government spokesperson. While still a long way from the full lockdowns imposed earlier in the pandemic, the new measures were described as a, quote, hammer blow for city center restaurants, cafes, and shops that are desperate for Christmas trade to rebuild their finances. Many lawmakers in Johnson's own party are also angry with the new restrictions fearing the impact they will have after the economy shrank by a historic 10 percent last year. While the race to vaccinate moves forward at full speed, Nigeria is discarding of up to one million jabs due to the many hurdles that come with inoculation in the continent. Up to one million COVID-19 vaccines are estimated to have expired in Nigeria last month without being used. It's one of the biggest single losses of doses that shows the difficulty African nations have getting people vaccinated. Governments on the continent of over one billion people have been pushing for more vaccine deliveries as inoculation rates lag richer regions. In Nigeria, Africa's most populous nation and home to more than 200 million people, fewer than 4% of adults have been fully vaccinated. That's according to the World Health Organization. Many African countries are finding they do not have the capacity to manage the shots, some of which come with a short shelf life. The expired doses were made by AstraZeneca and delivered from Europe, the sources with direct knowledge of vaccine delivery and use. They were supplied via COVAX, the dose-sharing facility led by the Gavi Vaccine Alliance and the WHO. A third source with knowledge of the delivery said some of the doses arrived within four to six weeks of expiry and could not be used in time, despite efforts by health authorities. A count of the expired doses is still underway and an official number is yet to be finalised, the sources said. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Numerous countries are following Washington's lead in announcing diplomatic boycotts of the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. Britain and Canada are the latest major countries to make the decision. Japan is also said to be considering doing the same. Following its traditional allies, Canada has become the latest nation to announce a diplomatic boycott of the upcoming Winter Olympics in China. We are extremely concerned by the repeated human rights violations. Uh, by the Chinese government. That is why uh, we are announcing today that we will not be sending any diplomatic representation to the Beijing Olympic or Paralympic Games this winter. Ottawa now joins their southern neighbour in taking a stand against Beijing's heavy-handed tactics. The brutal crackdown on pro-independence protesters in Hong Kong shocked many Western nations. On top of that, China's treatment of their minority Uyghur population in northwestern Xinjiang province has been labelled a genocide by some and drawn much international ire. Also withholding diplomatic representation is Australia, although Beijing didn't seem too concerned with that development. The United Kingdom has also announced that they won't be sending diplomatic representation to the Games, which China's UK embassy denounced as a politicalisation of sport. China has vowed firm countermeasures against those boycotting the Games. As for the athletes, their country's lack of diplomatic personnel won't affect their ability to take part in the Games when they get underway on February the 4th next year. 
The New South Wales SES Assistant Commissioner Nicole Hogan has said it was miraculous nobody was injured in the sudden storm in Sydney as she warned of more rain to come. There was hail in the Blue Mountains and damaging winds on the central coast while heavy rains drenched Sydney. It was stated that thunderstorms are likely to continue and so people must be aware of their surroundings and vigilant in regards to the weather that may be experienced. Hogan also said widespread rainfall was also expected on the New South Wales south coast and in the state's southeast in the next 48 hours. Strong winds are forecast for the Sydney coast while numerous flood warnings remain in place across the area. Sydney is set to reach a top of 22 degrees Celsius with showers increasing along the Melbourne and Brisbane are also facing showers with Brisbane also set for a possible storm. While warnings have been issued for much of Western Australia with people advised to activate their bushfire survival plans and watch for updates. U.S. President Joe Biden has stated that the possibility of stationing troops in Ukraine is not on the bargaining table at the moment, despite the heightening fear of invasion by Russia in the area. That is not on the table. What U.S. President Joe Biden on Wednesday said putting American troops on the ground in Ukraine to deter a potential Russian invasion was, quote, not on the table, particularly without the support of NATO allies. It would depend upon what the rest of the NATO countries were willing to do as well. But the idea the United States is going to unilaterally use force to confront Russia invading Ukraine is not on the, in the cards right now. But Biden said there would soon be high-level meetings with Russia and at least four major NATO allies to discuss the future of Russia's concerns about NATO and to try to bring down the temperature on Ukraine's eastern front, where tens of thousands of Russian troops have massed. The Kremlin has denied having intentions to attack Ukraine and says its troop buildup is defensive in nature. Speaking to reporters outside the White House, Biden said he made it clear to Russian President Vladimir Putin during their nearly two-hour virtual meeting on Tuesday that there would be economic consequences like none before if Russia invades Ukraine. I was very straightforward. There were no minced words. It was polite, but I made it very clear. If, in fact, he invades Ukraine, there will be severe consequences, severe consequences economic consequences like none he's ever seen. Biden had promised up to $60 million in military aid to Ukraine, the final elements of which will be arriving this week, Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby said Wednesday. Can you say what those are? Um, small arms and ammunition. Biden added that the U.S. had a moral and legal obligation to defend NATO allies if they are attacked, but that obligation did not extend to Ukraine, which is not a member of the alliance. The crisis in Sudan has seemingly worsened as international funding for the coup control country has been cut off with no access to about $650 million. The freeze comes with fears of major economic reforms. Sudan was unable to access $650 million in international funding in November when assistance was paused after a coup. That's according to the finance minister of the dissolved government, Jibril Ibrahim. The freeze puts in doubt basic import payments and the fate of economic reforms. Ibrahim, who was appointed to a civilian transitional government in February, said the main impact would be on development projects covering areas including water supply, electricity, agriculture, health and transport. He said he hoped international support would return gradually over the next three to six months. Meanwhile, bills could be paid and reforms would continue. Ibrahim said Sudan would seek investment rather than grants from wealthy Gulf Arab states that now face their own economic challenges. Foreign funding was seen as crucial in helping Sudan emerge from decades of isolation and supporting a transition towards democracy that began with the 2019 overthrow of Omar al-Bashir. But the October 25th coup upended that transition. The U.S. has put on hold $700 million in economic assistance since the coup. The World Bank, which had promised $2 billion in grants, has paused disbursements. France released a Saudi national arrested at the Paris airport over suspected links to the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi after officials concluded it was a case of mistaken identity. 
It's a case of mistaken identity. That's what the French authorities said Wednesday after releasing a Saudi man previously arrested in connection with the 2018 murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Whilst the 33-year-old detained at Paris's Charles de Gaulle airport on Tuesday is indeed Khalid Laotebi, he is not the former member of the Saudi Royal Guard. Listed in US intelligence reports as a member of the hit squad that killed and dismembered the journalist in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. After 24 hours of detention, he has been released. A few hours after the arrest on French soil, Saudi Arabia claimed it was a person with the same name. The alarm was sounded at passport control, where his details match those in an international red notice arrest warrant issued by Turkey. The murder and dismemberment of prominent critic Jamal Khashoggi caused a global divide between Saudi Arabia and the West. The kingdom's crown prince Mohammed bin Salman has staunchly denied any role, despite U.S. intelligence reports accusing him of sponsoring the assassination. Saudi Arabia insists it has carried out justice and that the case is closed. A Riyadh court convicted eight unnamed people in a secret trial in 2019, with five people given death sentences that were later reduced to prison terms. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Hong Kong media mogul Jimmy Lai, along with two other prominent activists, have been found guilty for taking part in a vigil to mark the Tiananmen massacre. The bodies of India's defence chief and 12 others who died in a helicopter crash will be brought to New Delhi, where the top general will be laid to rest with full military honours. Investigators in New York City say the suspected arsonists climbed the 50-foot structure, lit papers and shoved them into the all-American Christmas tree outside of the Fox News Company headquarters in Manhattan. A motorbike rigged with explosive went off in Iraq's southern city of Basra, killing at least four people. There was no immediate claim of responsibility. NASA set out to explore some of the universe's deepest mysteries when it launched its imaging X-ray polarimetry explorer on SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. Burkina Faso's premier and government resigned as protests mounted against officials' inability to combat a wave of jihadist attacks that have killed thousands. Instagram said it will be stricter about the types of content it recommends to teens in the photo sharing app and will nudge them towards different areas if they dwell on one topic for a long time. Instagram announced a slew of changes meant to better protect teenage users of the image sharing app. The new rules come just before Adam Mosseri, the head of Instagram, is set to testify before Congress. Through a blog post, Instagram on Tuesday said it will more carefully curate the kinds of content it recommends to teenagers and will try to nudge youngsters if they dwell on one topic for too long. The photo sharing app and its parent company Meta, formerly known as Facebook, both have been under fire for the ways their services could present an online safety risk for younger users and cause body image issues for teenage girls. Scrutiny from lawmakers and state attorneys general ratcheted up after a Wall Street Journal report said internal documents leaked by former Facebook employee Francis Hogan showed the company knew Instagram could have harmful mental effects on teenage girls. Facebook has said the leaked documents have been used to paint a false picture of the company's work. Instagram's announcement isn't likely to change what is sure to be a bipartisan tongue lashing at Wednesday's Senate hearing. In response to the blog post, Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn criticized the announcement, calling it, quote, hollow, and in a statement said, quote, Meta is attempting to shift attention from their mistakes by rolling out parental guides, use timers, and content control features that consumers should have had all along. Instagram said it will roll out its first tools for parents and guardians to see how much time their teens spend on the app and set time limits early next year. An Instagram spokeswoman said it would continue its pause on plans for a version of Instagram for kids. That project was suspended amid growing opposition. 
And finally tonight, Sydney lit up with Christmas light installations across the city centre, encouraging residents to get out and enjoy the festive season after a year that saw an extended coronavirus lockdowns across the city. At St Mary's Cathedral in the heart of Sydney is bathed in a visual light display highlighting the meaning of Christmas with scenes of an angel, Mary and Joseph and the three wise men riding camels. Shoppers browse stores in Pitt Street Mall under the canopy of lights as others walk through a candy cane inspired light installation in Darling Harbour Precinct. The tallest Christmas tree in New South Wales state stood in Martin Place decorated with more than 110,000 LED lights and 330 bubbles as Christmas carols flooded the square and added to the joyous spirit of the season. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.